Well, everyone is different, but there are some herbs that I think are sending out the message that they should be used by the general public. And those are herbs that are growing everywhere. It, to me, the dandelion, which is ever present, is saying, use me lots, I'm everywhere, I'm right outside your door. So I would really like to help people rethink their opinion of weeds and see that many of the things that grow prolifically that come up in our gardens and right outside our homes, like purslane, for example, uh, stinging nettles, miner's lettuce, um, these are wonderful herbs for daily use and I love to include them in salad. But of course people don't need to take herbs that have strong antimicrobial effects unless they have a need for that. But I'd say a lot of the common weeds are great for daily use. Red clover blossoms might be another one. Well. I certainly see that there's a place for pharmaceutical drugs, although I haven't had to take them in several decades. But herbs nourish us. And I sometimes hear the argument from people that the herbs haven't been properly tested in a laboratory. But herbs have been used by millions of people for thousands of years. And to me, that is a lot more valid than a two-year rat or rabbit study. So um, the herbs nourish us. They transform minerals from the earth and provide us not only with activities such as anti-inflammatory activity or analgesic activity, but they actually give us vitamins, minerals, essential oils that in themselves are nourishing and have healing properties. Mm, increased male sex drive. Well, I would start with nourishing your relationship and better communication and more massage and affection. Um, and then food is really important. So eating more black colored foods, more nuts and seeds, which are full of zinc and vitamin E, which nourishes our reproductive energy. And rather than uh, taking a pill to enhance libido that might work within an hour, Herbs that can enhance libido might be used over a period of time to actually build sexual energy. So I think of herbs like ginseng, ginkgo biloba, epimedium. Um, these are all things that are tonics. Pine pollen is another one. But we also don't want to use herbs like a Band-Aid. We want to really look at the whole picture of nourishing the whole body. So remember that sexual energy is extra energy. So we deplete our sexual energy by overdoing junk food and eating too many saturated fats that clog our arteries and also, you know, not really prioritizing our relationships. So that is the most important. Well, according to the principles of Asian medicine, we can enhance our lifelong memory by taking good care of our kidneys. So again, we don't want to just use herbs uh, allopathically. We want to think about avoiding things that are damaging to our mental well-being. I think a lot of people wake up with food hangovers. Maybe they've been overeating refined carbohydrates or uh, cold fatty foods like ice cream before bed. And you wake up feeling like maybe you've been drinking and you really haven't been. We know that aluminum is a very soft metal that comes out in our food and that when they've done autopsies on people that have mental dysfunction like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, they often have levels of aluminum in their body. We should also think about mercury dental fillings or even aluminum that gets into our bodies through silver fillings and um, just chemical pollution that we're exposed to that we breathe in the air. But think about eating more black colored foods for our memory, things like black sesame seeds, black chia seeds. I love chia seeds, I think they're extraordinary. They're high in omega-3 fatty acids. And rather than thinking we all need to eat fish oils, well, there are vegetable sources of omega-3s. Spirulina, which is a spiral-shaped microalgae, is great for brain alertness. Also, we need to use our brains. You know, use it or you lose it. If all you're doing is reading magazines and playing video games, you're not really exercising your brain. So, you know, use your hands. I'm a big believer in uh, doing crafts your whole life, knitting, crocheting, sketching, playing an instrument. This is really good for uh, enhancing neural transport in our bodies. Of course, one of the most popular herbs for mental alertness is ginkgo biloba, and, and that's a great one. But we don't want to think that an herb by itself is going to do it. We need to 
put intelligent things into our brains and utilize that. Well, also according to the principles of Asian medicine, depression is a liver-centered condition. And I don't think there's many people that go to a psychiatrist or a therapist and when they say, I'm depressed, are told, what are you doing for your liver? But that's really where we should start. So we're actually undermining the health of our livers by eating the wrong kinds of fats. I'm a big believer in um, using good quality fats, things like avocados, nuts and seeds, uh, extra virgin olive oil I would use for salad dressing and really forget about the canola and the soy and the corn oil. I would think more about coconut oil. But we can help um, depression by using more sour foods, drinking lemon and water, eating more berries. We could also um, use more greens. The liver loves it when we eat greens. Greens are so high in chlorophyll and chlorophyll brings oxygen into our bodies and even though our brains only weigh about 2% of our total body weight, they require about 20% of the oxygen that we intake. So simply breathing more deeply or uh, exploring practices such as pranayama yoga or kundalini yoga can be very mentally enhancing. One of the most famous herbs for depression is St. John's wort, uh, Hypericum perfoliatum, but it's been found to work from mild to moderate depression. Um, but I also use herbs like lavender, and not only uh, taking lavender as a tea, but smelling lavender essential oil. Um, another one might be uh, kava kava. So it's always good to look at the individual and work with food, herbs, and attitude. Get outdoors in full spectrum light for about 20 minutes a day. We know that there's something called seasonal affectative disorder or, or SAD, uh, which uh, results from people going to work in the dark, coming home in the dark, sitting under fluorescent lights all day. So a little bit of full spectrum light, maybe even without sunglasses or contact lenses, can also really help let the light shine through. So St. John's Ward, it's interesting, it can enhance photosensitivity which might be a problem because you could get sunburned. But one of the reasons why St. John's wort works so well is it actually enhances our light receptivity. So we are so connected to nature. Migraine headaches, a good place to start is what's causing them. And there's many foods that have been implicated in migraine headaches. Again, uh, in Asian medicine, it's said that migraines are liver fire rising, that the liver can't process something. So the heat rises and causes inflammation and stagnation in the brain and pain. So um, I would say it's always good to look at what was going on in your life when this started. For many people, they might say that migraine started at puberty or maybe in their teen years. And that might be an indication that there could be a hormonal uh, factor going on. But rather than thinking we need to change our hormones, it may be that we need to help our liver better deal with the overload of hormones. So again, sour foods like lemon and water, more greens. So uh, food allergies can be huge. You know, it's interesting, the word migraine, I like to think of it as my grain. Don't take away my bread. <laughs> Very often we crave the, the foods that are the worst for us. And um, I'm, I'm partly French Canadian. And it's interesting that the word um, for bread is le pain, which is spelled P-A-I-N, like pain. And I've seen people go off gluten and have release from their migraine headaches. I've seen people go off dairy, but it could be, you know, chocolate as much as I love it, could be a trigger, avocados, might be a trigger. So it might be very helpful for people to keep a food journal and see if there's any pattern and look at what did you eat the night before. I went to the airport with a friend a few weeks ago and he felt compelled that he needed to uh, have french fries at the airport and the next day he had a terrible migraine headache and you know, I was trying to be polite and not say, you know, I those french fries, they probably reheated that oil 
over and over and over again, which is going to give you all kinds of free radicals and trans fats. And, you know, you might want to see if that happens again. But, you know, cranial sacral work and making sure you have good posture. And herbs for migraines, there's many. Feverfew, butterbur, also known as pedicytes, um, lavender, uh, rosemary. These are all herbs that have been used by millions of people for thousands of years. High stress, well, you know, we don't want to say, take an herb and all your stress away. When your life is falling apart and you have financial ruin and uh, divorce is looming. Um, so what can we do for stress? Try to change the condition that's going on and find ways to cope with stress. So um, very often when we're stressed, we take worse care of ourselves. You know, people when they're stressed might use that as an excuse to drink more alcohol, eat more sugar, uh, you know, subsist off of coffee and no sleep or, uh, you know, start using drugs that they weren't using before. So I always am reminded that when we're stressed, we need to focus on what are the blessings in our life rather than only taking on the, the difficulties in our life. Um, so that, that's really important because we often over identify with the stressors. We want to get adequate sleep. I think I would be a crazy woman if I didn't have a bathtub and the ability to use essential oils in the bath. So one of the things I love to do for stress and has helped me get through very, very difficult times, even though I might be sobbing, is to soak in the bathtub with maybe seven to 10 drops of essential oil, like lavender oil. And then another little technique is um, stay in the tub while maybe you're sobbing and ah, um, and then stay in the tub and let the water out and visualize your stress going down the drain. I find that to be very, very powerful. Wearing the color blue can be helpful for stress. Um, there are herbs that can help you get through a stressful time. I think of kava kava, which is a native herb to uh, Polynesia. It's uh, anti-anxiety, it's mildly euphoric. I think of a valerian root, and even though valerian is often used as a sedative and to help people sleep, mind you, it doesn't work for everybody. Some people get more energized from valerian, but I found that in difficult times in life, using valerian actually helps me to get through the day and get my work done and have a smile on my face because I'm more relaxed as I face life's adversities. And we should also remember that in retrospect, very often the most difficult challenges in our life are also our greatest teachers. So even though we may go through great adversity, you may find in a few years that there was something important to learn from that that has helped you to be a better person. So lowering cholesterol. Well, first of all, I don't think that cholesterol is the demon that it's been made out to be. Um, we should be also concerned about levels of homocysteine, um, which can be corrected by B vitamin intake. So cholesterol might be high in a vegetarian, it might be low in someone who eats a lot of red meat. Um, but I find that we have monitored cholesterol and very often that becomes a reason for people to stay on medication for the rest of their lives and have continuous medical visits. And of course, being on cholesterol lowering drugs can also inhibit hormonal production. We need some cholesterol in order to make our sex hormones and steroidal hormones. So um, one of my favorite remedies for lowering cholesterol is to drink lemon and water. The juice of half a lemon in a glass of water helps to fluidify the blood. Eating two to three tart apples a day can bind with cholesterol. Apples contain pectin, which has a magnetic-like activity to bind with the cholesterol and carry it out of your body via the digestive system. And that's a very pleasant enough remedy. And there are herbs that can lower cholesterol. A uh, hawthorn berry is one of my favorites. It's a member of the rose family, much like apples and peaches and cherries. And hawthorn berries has been known to reduce arterial plaque to uh, normalize blood pressure, and it even helps to strengthen the contractive force of the heart because of its high calcium chloride content. So before we sign up for a lifelong program of pharmaceutical drugs, 
you know, look at diet, look at herbs. And we also know that refined carbohydrates and sugar can elevate cholesterol. It's not only the fats that we need to be concerned about. So I'm really encouraging people to, you know, take charge of their health and pay attention rather than, you know, taking the first drug that's offered to you. I mean, really, there's a lot of times we should say no to drugs and pharmaceutical drugs are really at the top of the list and become your own physician. And um, I think very often people shrug it off and say, well, high cholesterol is in my family. There's nothing we can do about it. And yes, genetics do play a factor, but whatever our genetics give us, it means that we need to work harder and more diligently to overcome what nature has given us. So we might have also inherited that, you know, Uncle Bob ate, you know, a pound of bacon every Saturday morning and um, a loaf of white bread. So we don't have to inherit the bad habits of our ancestors. So in order to protect the thyroid, well, if we really want to get to the core, we should protect ourselves from drinking fluoridated water and fluoridated water is still practiced in the United States, although I think there's many counties that are campaigning against it, so please uh, address that issue. We also know that peanuts can inhibit thyroid function. Soy can inhibit thyroid function. I know a lot of people are concerned about eating raw, cruciferous vegetables, which are things like broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower, but I certainly am not cutting those out of my diet because when you cook those, you also decrease their anti-cancer properties, their content of iso, um, isothiocyanates. So um, eating seaweeds is one of the ways we can nourish our thyroid glands. So we want to select seaweeds from clean waters. Lately, I've been buying seaweeds from the Atlantic North Coast, but remember it's all one ocean and our oceans are becoming uh, terribly polluted. So we all, all need to take a stand and do what we can to protect our oceans. But um, seaweeds like kelp and dulse can be sprinkled on our food. We can find them in capsules. Um, you know, you don't have to um, put uh, fish in nori wrappers. You can put uh, guacamole. You can put shredded up cauliflower. You can put carrots and avocados and make wonderful nori wraps and really make friends with seaweed. Um, seaweeds grow in this mineral rich brine of the ocean and they transform the ocean's minerals in a way so that our bodies can utilize them and benefit. So um, also in Asian medicine, the health of our thyroid is governed by the health of our kidneys. So again, look at not only the type of water that we're drinking, how much we're drinking water, but we should also think about um, uh, eating more black colored foods. Our thyroids enjoy a bit of light exposure. So getting outdoors and getting some light on this gland because light does penetrate your skin and maybe not be wearing a turtleneck or a scarf all the time. And you can actually massage your thyroid gland, maybe even using a little bit of essential oil of frankincense to kind of gently massage up and down the thyroid gland. So love your thyroid, it governs metabolism. And one last thing to help our thyroid gland is improve the quality of salt that you're eating. We know that many people developed uh, goiters in the 1950s when there was uh, no iodine in the salt. Unfortunately, we have totally turned salt into a drug. Uh, salt is usually heated to about 1400 degrees. All the minerals are removed from it, and then they sell those minerals to the vitamin companies. So you could do yourself a favor by um, maybe using kelp and dulse to salt your food, but also look at better quality salt like Celtic salt or Himalayan salt or um, uh, orso, mineral, orso mineral salt would be another one. Salt really should not be white, just like sugar shouldn't be white. Um, we want to eat whole foods as unrefined as possible. Insomnia, so many people suffer from insomnia. So I'm a big believer in getting ready for the next day, the night before. It gives you less to think and worry about while you're trying to sleep. So that might mean check the weather and lay out your clothes. Are you gonna need a sweater? Are you gonna need an extra pair of socks? Um, you know, get your clothes out of the laundry, empty the dishwasher, make sure you have what you need to give the kids breakfast. Um, if you drive a car, you know, maybe have the car filled up, whatever it is so that you can start the next day with a clean slate. 
And then um, light triggers wakefulness. So as we move into our sleeping time, you might think about dimming the lights. So when we go from staring at a computer to total darkness, our brains are usually not totally adjusted. So I, um, I teach in Iceland every year and in the summertime it's light even at three in the morning. And I found that if I put a, a you know, t-shirt or an eye pillow over my eyes, I would sleep so deeply. And now I am such a big believer on sleeping with an eye pillow or a little mask. But a lot of times we think our rooms are dark, but there's, um, you know, smoke alarms and there's digital clocks and there's night lights and there's street lights creeping in through the curtains. So darkness is very helpful. A warm bath before bed can be relaxing. Um, when I spoke about getting ready for the next day, that might mean having your books and your paperwork, looking at your day timer. And um, also if we would stop eating and drinking three hours before bed. Some people might not like that, but if we eat before bed, we're actually energizing ourselves and uh, stimulating ourselves. And we're going to find that our digestion is better and our sleep is better. So one of my uh, lifestyle techniques is to right after dinner, which is usually eaten earlier, is to floss, brush my teeth, use the water pick and then say, the kitchen is closed, tempt me not, I don't care what it is, organic kale chips, no thank you, I'm done for the day eating. And then, of course, there are herbs to help us sleep. I've mentioned uh, kava kava and valerian, um, oat straw, passion flower, which helps you to sleep, not to be more passionate, lemon balm. And you don't have to reinvent anything. You can go to a health food store or an herb store and buy a tea, a tincture, or a capsule that's already prepared into maybe a, a good tasting tea. Now, if you drink tea right before bed, you may have to wake up to go to the bathroom, which can also uh, keep you from falling back to sleep. So you might find that two capsules with just a little bit of water or a dropper full or two of tincture can also help you to sleep. And there's, you know, wonderful homeopathic remedies. One of the ones that I sometimes use, it sounds a little ironic, but homeopathic coffee accruda, which is made from coffee, in very, very dilute amounts can actually help calm a racing mind. And then when we are in the activity of trying to fall asleep, think of nothing but the in and out of your breathing. It's really easy to get all stimulated if you're thinking about, you know, this or that or that cute person at work or what you're going to do tomorrow. So just, you know, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream. I think uh, one of the Beatles said that. Herbs to strengthen the liver. Love your liver <laughs> so you don't have to get a new one. Um, our livers are really our great filtering agent of our body and they do so much for us and I think a lot of people get confused you know what does the liver do and where are the kidneys um, but you know your liver on the right side our liver is really sensitive to pesticides and uh, hormones that have been added, added to animal foods artificial colors excitotoxins like NutraSweet and monosodium glutamate so we want to protect our livers from all of those chemicals that creep into our food and environment as much as possible so our liver really benefits from the sour flavor so Eating more berries is a great thing to do. And of course you would want to eat organic berries. So, you know, I think of berries as like colorful jewels full of, uh, you know, uh, anthocyanidins and anti-cancer compounds, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, you know, all those colorful, slightly sour foods. Um, kiwi would be another sour food. Sauerkraut would be another sour food that can benefit the liver. Uh, lemon and water and other citrus uh, products like you know grapefruit and um, lime so make frequent use of those and then eat more greens one of the ways that we can help our livers is uh, by using greens now some greens are really high in something called uh, calcium oxalate which can actually um, help in the formation of kidney stones which is something you don't want so uh, i like uh, kale and dandelion greens they're actually lower in oxalates than greens such as beet greens or swiss chard or um, spinach for that matter so our liver also benefits from some herbs that have traditionally been used to improve their function i think of dandelion root
burdock root, yellow dock root, and they can all be mixed together into a tea. And since they're all roots, they should be you know, steeped at maybe, or, or simmered maybe for about 20 minutes with the lid on or uh, made in a jar overnight so they get to steep with the help of thyme rather than uh, being harshly boiled. Uh, and you might find that these same herbs also help to clear up skin conditions like acne and eczema and psoriasis. So um, again, avoid damaging your liver with you know, too much coffee and alcohol, prescription drugs. All prescription drugs are hard on the liver and kidneys. So we do have some control over our blood sugar. And one way of doing that is not only to avoid sugar, but refined carbohydrates. And you know, I, th I think we've seen the natural foods movement go through a lot of cycles because, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was all about eat more whole grains. But we're finding out that, you know, grains, maybe because they've been hybridized, maybe because they've been ground into a flour and go rancid, can also cause um, blood sugar elevation. Fruit juice, you know, even though um, it's certainly healthier than a lot of things are so high in sugar. So it would be healthier to eat an apple or eat an orange rather than drinking a glass of apple juice. Because when you eat the fruit, you get the fiber and that can um, you know, slow down the elevation of blood sugar. But one of the wonderful herbs for stabilizing blood sugar right now that is in everyone's kitchen or should be is cinnamon. And cinnamon tastes good. It can help reduce the cravings for sweets. It um, can be added to our food, such as, you know, if I were going to make applesauce, I would sweeten it with cinnamon. I allow myself a teaspoon of honey every morning when I have my first cup of herbal tea, but because I sometimes drink five or six cups of herbal tea during the day, I don't want to be adding a teaspoon of honey to every cup. So I might use a little bit of cinnamon extract to sweeten the tea. Cinnamon also comes in capsules. There are other herbs that have been found to help diabetes. The prickly pear cactus that is prevalent in desert areas and in the you know southwest and the, the the American West, uh, fenugreek seed. Fenugreek seed um, has a natural sweetness to it and blood sugar stabilizing property. It's interesting because they use fenugreek seed to make artificial maple syrup. Um, and it has a really nice maple syrup taste, especially when the seeds are roasted. Um, those are just a few of the herbs, but I also want to mention that uh, there's a supplement called GTF chromium. And GTF chromium, the GTF stands for glucose tolerance factor. And I realize maybe not everybody wants to use this and some people might even feel a little uh, gaseous or bloated when they eat it, but nutritional yeast is a source of GTF chromium. Uh, black pepper is another source. And of course, you can also buy it in tablets and 200 micrograms used throughout the day can help stabilize blood sugar, help reduce cravings and help reduce our desire to use addictive substances as well. So there's so many herbal allies out there and nutritional allies and you know the information is easy to find there's so many great books out there and websites and um, you just need to take charge and learn what it is and give it a try before you sign up for a, a lifelong of drugs and I, I will say that I um, I was with a Native American man for a while who had a pump in his stomach and it was pumping diabetes medication into him constantly every day. And after one month of changing his diet and including uh, superfoods like chia seeds and uh, switching from bread to quinoa um, and then using sh uh, cinnamon capsules, within a month, they took the pump out of his stomach and said, you don't have diabetes anymore. And of course, there's wonderful work uh, being done by Dr. Gabriel Cousins at the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center, where you know, he's one, done a wonderful movie about, um, I think it's called Raw for 30 Days, where a number of people with diabetes within a month were free of diabetes. Now, we're often taught that certain diseases are incurable, but that often means that there's not a drug that's going to cure it. And one of the things about natural medicine is natural medicine is for people that are motivated. If you want somebody to do it for you, 
uh, and you're not going to make any changes yourself, well, then you should probably listen to everything that your doctor tells you. But if you're motivated and, and positive and saying, I'm going to take charge, I'm going to learn what I can about this. I might have to try three or four different herbs. I might have to combine some things. I might need to see a few different practitioners to learn the information I need. I believe that, you know, there's not incurable diseases. They're just incurable people. Are there herbs for candida? Well, um, we need to stop doing the things that encourage candida, the sugar, the fruit juice, the um, you know, bread, alcohol, those all nourish candida. Um, and as far as herbs that are anti-candida, garlic is a great one. Garlic is antifungal. Uh, certainly, most people know about probiotics, uh, a probiotic supplement and eating more probiotic rich food. So it's interesting because very often the candida diet says don't eat anything fermented. Nothing fermented. And I had candida myself years ago and I went to visit one of my teachers, Susan Weed, and uh, I said, I have candida. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I eat really clean. I don't eat any sweets. I don't eat anything fermented. And she said, you need to stop trying to kill the candida, but outnumber it. And I said, well, how do I do that? She said, you should make, um, you know, uh, yogurt and add uh, probiotics to it. You should eat unpasteurized sauerkraut. You should eat wild, unwashed fruit. You, she actually said you should eat um, greens from the garden without washing them to ingest soil microorganisms. And I'll share that the candida was gone in two weeks and never returned. But we also have allies like uh, tea tree oil, which could be added to the bath. I don't want to suggest ingesting essential oils unless you've really been trained in it because they're very strong and very concentrated. Um, but garlic is certainly a great ally and eating lower carbohydrate vegetables, more greens, more things like, you know, kale and cabbage and asparagus. And um, so uh, it's almost like outnumbering the candida seems to work very well. And uh, being on the pill, taking antibiotics, eating animal foods where the animals are treated with antibiotics. But remember that we all have some candida in our bodies. It's normal to have some. What's abnormal is to have elevated levels of it that impair our health. Well, there's many ways to take herbs. One of my favorite ways is to make um, a green drink. I like to call it my wild weed drink. And we try to do this almost every day. So this is what you can do with all that extra mint and lemon balm and dandelion greens that you might have in your yard that you were afraid take over. So what you do is you fill your blender with weeds. And I don't wash them. I actually want those soil microorganisms, that little bit of dirt can actually enhance uh, your ability to manufacture vitamin B12. Um, but of course, I don't want to ever collect weeds f next to a busy street or within 50 feet of a busy street or where they have been um, herbicided within two years. So usually the backyard is a safer bet or somewhere you know wild in the wilderness. Stuff the blender add maybe one apple or one piece of fruit that's in season, a pear, a peach, or something like that without the peach pit, um, and then fill it with water. Blend it all up, and then go to the hardware store and get yourself a paint strainer bag. So you squeeze all of this through the paint strainer bag, and voila, you have made a green juice in about a minute. And the vitality that you feel from drinking a juice where the plants were growing a minute earlier is unsurpassed. It really does make you feel like a superhuman. But I'm gonna share another use of uh, herbs, and I call this a uh, fruit whip, wild weed fruit whip. So um, I go out and collect wild weeds, and usually what I love is raw stinging nettle. And for the uninitiated, you might wanna wear gloves while you collect the nettles, but I don't because I think getting stung with stinging nettles helps to prevent arthritis, which has run in my family and I certainly don't wanna have it. I wanna be able to knit and crochet and turn the pages of books and you know massage my grandchildren my whole long life. So um, you blend up your weeds, and again, it could be mint, dandelion, miner's lettuce, malva, chickweed, with some uh, fruit an avocado, an apple, a banana, blend it all up. Hey, you, now you have this green whip. 
and you decorate it with things like cacao nibs and goji berries, maybe some fresh blueberries, and you eat that for breakfast, and that's another superhero secret food. But you can also use herbs in a tea. You can buy them in a tincture, and you can learn to make tinctures. It's very easy with uh, using either apple cider vinegar or vodka or vegetable glycerin. And my book, The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine, has really easy directions on how to make herbal tinctures. You can also uh, buy them already made in capsules. And if you're really adventurous, you could dry the herbs, grind them up in the blender, and fill the capsules yourself. So, um, but if you're new at this, you might as well support some companies that are doing a great job and go to the health food store. And of course, there's some herbs that don't taste very good. If you think you're going to drink valerian root tea, you'll probably say this smells and tastes like a locker room of dirty socks, no thank you. So there are some herbs that you might prefer in a capsule or even a tincture. Well, essential oils are part of the plant's immune system. So let's say uh, a plant has its leaf broken, those essential oils are going to help prevent viral and fungal infestation in the plant. So essential oils can also help our immune system. We know that all of the essential oils have antimicrobial properties. And antimicrobial really means antiviral, antifungal, anti uh, uh, bacterial, and some are stronger than others. Some of the strongest are tea tree and oregano and pine and uh, lavender. Um, but our nasal cavities are in very close proximity to our brain. So if we smell something, those essential oils are actually going in to the brain and they're also going into our bloodstream. And you can find residues of those essential oils for several hours afterwards. So we really should be thinking about what we are applying to our skin as far as lotions and shampoos and conditioners and things like that. Because we absorb about 60% of what we put on our bodies into our bloodstream. So I do love essential oils to create an atmosphere, but they can also open up different neural pathways. So for example, I might be having a difficult day and thinking I'm so uh, anxious, I'm so frustrated, I feel ill at ease, and then I open up a bottle of say lavender oil and I might take you know, five deep inhalations on each side of my, um, my nose, and it opens up a different neural pathway. So rather than going down the I'm freaking out neural pathway, now I'm going down lavender lane, which is really a lot more pleasant. Um, but another way we can use essential oils is in the bath which has a very calming effect. But no, they are much more than just a placebo or a pleasant atmosphere. But yes, they do that. And that's why we really want to think about, you know, what are we scenting our rooms with? A lot of uh, things that people think are freshening the air are actually exposing us to petrochemicals that can cause brain impairment and should not be used in the home or workplace. So flower essences, um, the first exploration of flower essences that I've heard of is the work of Dr. Um, Bach. He was a bacteriologist who lived in England in the early part of the 1900s, and he left a successful practice to really be one with the flowers. And he traveled um, into northern England and spent time experimenting with flowers, putting them in water, putting them on his body, meditating with them, praying with them, and really just you know being open to the flower of the power of the flowers. And he came up with 38 different remedies. And they were all plants that grew in England, you know, holly and cherry plum and star of Bethlehem, which is a flower, not a, not a star. Um, and he found that they affected the emotional body. Now, for some people, you might say that the effects are mild, but I've given flower essences to cats. Um, and I found that it helped them. And it certainly wasn't placebo because they didn't know I was putting flower essences in their water. And, uh, you know, probably one of the most, most powerful and one of those like don't leave home without it things is Rescue Remedy, which is a combination of five different flowers. Um, if, uh, so Rescue Remedy is the remedy for crises and, you know, fear of flying and, you know, fear of public speaking or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but it contains five different flowers, a cherry plum for desperation, impatience for stress, 
uh, clematis for loss of consciousness and that far away feeling. There's rock rose for terror and panic. And I think there's one other that I'm not thinking of, um, Star of Bethlehem, the great comforter of sorrows. And if you've never tried Rescue Remedy, it really is amazing. It's like a small miracle in a bottle. And again, it may not make the problems go away, but I've used it during arguments. I've used it um, for fear. I've used it for, um, I've given it to strangers on an airplane who were like flying for the first time. I was a little, um, angry at my kids because they both went and got tattooed when they were 12 and 16. They skipped school. It was like, what? You went and got tattooed and Mr. Wizard believed you were 18 and you're 12? And they said, but mom, we took Rescue Remedy. So I was supposed to be so pleased that they knew Rescue Remedy would help them with the stress of uh, skipping school, getting in trouble and getting tattooed while underage and mom not being too happy about it. But I have to admit, their tattoos were kind of cute. <laughs> well, flower essences, I would say, work more on the emotional body. So for example, holly is good for suspicion and jealousy, or um, you know, clematis for, uh, for far away feeling, not being grounded in your body. So, but clematis is not used as a tea. Um, I, I think there's been some historical use of it for migraine headaches, but it's not a well often used herb. So I would say that flower essences are kind of their own uh, division of learning. Uh, they're certainly used by herbalists, but they're not interchangeably used um, as they would be as an herbal tea. So they really have a different purpose. And it's worth studying, but um, I would say that it's, it's more for the emotional body, whereas the herbs could be used for the physical or emotional body. Well, using herbs as a tea is wonderful because um, not only is herbal tea very economical, but it gives us time to reflect on what's going on. So let's say, you know, in the morning, rather than, you know, driving to work and getting some kind of, uh, you know, fast food coffee as you navigate traffic and all that, um, having a cup of herbal tea could really be an opportunity for affirmation and reflection. So you could be, you know, holding your cup of herbal tea and smelling the pleasant aroma and also be thinking to yourself and encouraging yourself saying, I'm nourishing my nervous system. I'm supporting my immune system. And so the aroma is going into your nostrils and going into your brain. The, you're tasting the herbs and that's going to have a physiological effect. And so our brain is really like a great, you know, receptor of flavor and aroma. So um, yes, herbal tea is wonderful and I probably drink a quart of herbal tea a day and it's not the same herb every day, but um, it's certainly a part of a great health practice. The best way to take herbs, there's many ways to take them. So again, I've, we can use them in our culinary arts. So when you, you know, spice a meal and you use herbs like ginger or cumin or oregano or Maybe this is going to enable you to use less salt or less fat to flavor your food. You know, rosemary on popcorn, for example, or um, you know, beans that are cooked with cumin or coriander might be more digestible. Um, when you flavor a salad dressing with you know garlic, maybe you can back off the salt. So. Um, you know, tasting the herbs and using them in food is wonderful. Cinnamon might enable you to use less sugar, for example. But um, herbal, uh, herbal tea is certainly, you know, part of our intake of more fluids during the day. But not everyone has the ability to make herbal tea. If you're going to school or work and there's not, you know, tea kettle or stove there, it might not really be a possibility. So herbal tinctures are made by uh, steeping herbs, you, often fresh herbs, but sometimes dried herbs, in some type of food grade alcohol, like vodka or brandy. Um, and I learned from my grandmother, who's really who influenced me to start studying herbs at a very young age, to uh, collect your herbs around the time of the full moon and then strain them out around the time of the, the next full moon. So I often let them steep for a month. And yes, they are often steeped in vodka or brandy or sometimes even Everclear, which I don't like the taste of. If you use Everclear, you need to use half 50% uh, water. But I'm really not a big alcohol consumer myself. Um, therefore, there are alternative ways of steeping your herbs. 
Um, but before I tell you what those are, I will say that herbs that are steeped in alcohol have a very, very long shelf life. I've used them like a decade later and they're still very effective. So the alcohol works as a medium to extract both the water soluble and the alcohol soluble properties of the plant. It also is a very good preservative. But again, a pregnant woman, a nursing mother, a small child, a recovering alcoholic might want to totally avoid alcohol. So you could also use apple cider vinegar or vegetable glycerin. And those have a shorter shelf life, more like two years, but for most of us, that's plenty long enough. Uh, the glycerin tastes good. That seems to be a great medium for children. Um, the herb tinctures are considered not as strong, but I, there's many ways of going about it that can avoid the alcohol. Some people say you could uh, add the alcohol tincture to hot water and the alcohol will evaporate, but I do think the people could get pretty ripped from drinking Kahlua and coffee, so I don't know how accurate that is. So what about cannabis? Well, you know, cannabis is an herb. As a matter of fact, cannabis sativa, sativa means with a long history of cultivation, and Carl Sagan believed it is the oldest cultivated plant on the face of the earth. So um, I've often said, you know, I stand for all plants. Um, plants were made by the great creator of all, um, and I have great trust. It doesn't mean, you know, that um, poison ivy is my favorite plant, but even that is used as a homeopathic remedy. Well, we're finding out so many amazing things about cannabis. Uh, one is that it could help heal so many problems of our environment. We could be fueling our automobiles and airplanes with oil made from the cannabis seed. We could be using hemp seed as a protein, which is not psychoactive at all. It's actually a great source of vegetarian protein, much easier to digest than soybeans. I did write a hemp cookbook, the Hemp Nut Health cookbook with my friend Richard Rose. We're also finding out that hemp fiber made from the stalks of the plant make a wonderful fabric. And I know as health activists, we're often questioning, you know, cotton is one of the most highly pesticided plants on the face of the earth because it is uh, not considered a food crop. And so cotton is highly contaminated, which is contributing to the demise of our, our planet and the clean water. Whereas hemp can be grown with really no pesticides, especially when it's grown outdoors. Um, hemp could also be used to make paper. Um, and we are cutting down forests to make newspapers that get tossed in the recycle bin when we're done. But hemp paper doesn't yellow, it's very durable, and because it's much easier to um, dissolve something in hemp called lignans, um, because they have, hemp has much less lignans than trees, we would use maybe one-seventh the amount of chemicals to be making hemp out of paper. I live in the great state of Colorado where I'm pleased to say that we have totally legalized cannabis. And uh, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and we've been voted the fittest city in America, the best red city in America, the foodiest city in America. Um, we've seen domestic violence decrease since cannabis has been legal. Prescription drug use, um, including uh, you know, uh, sleeping pills and pain medications have also decreased. I see that cannabis is a threat to the pharmaceutical industry, to the oil industry, to the paper industry. And um, you know, another wonderful use of cannabis is if we planted it everywhere, it would choke out problem weeds like poison ivy and uh, Canadian thistle and spotted knapweed. And I would much prefer that than pesticides being used in my environment. So cannabis can choke out weeds that are might, may, might be problematic for an area. But another benefit of cannabis is that it grows very tall, really as tall as a tree in one season. And it produces seeds uh, high up on top of the plant. And those seeds are wonderful food for birds. So if hemp were free to be growing outdoors, it would be food for the birds who would build nests in that area and then help to consume insects like mosquitoes and things that we might not want. As far as a medicinal plant, um, you know, juicing the fresh cannabis leaves, which is not psychoactive at all, is being found. I mean, check out some YouTubes on it, but people are claiming to cure themselves of cancer. Um, 
Cannabis oil is being found to help conditions like multiple sclerosis, uh, seizures, in, um, even in children, attention deficit disorder. So because this plant was made illegal, um, I believe in the Harrison Drug Act, um, and then it got re-legalized during World War II for a short period of time so we can make soldiers uniforms and uh, sailing ship sails and all that. You know, our pioneer ancestors crossed this country in uh, covered wagons that were covered with canvas. The word canvas also comes from cannabis. So I really don't know another plant that could do as many things. Do I think this is an excuse to be uh, a pothead? No, I don't. I value my health, but um, I think that there's certainly a lot of medicinal uses. And um, as far as harm reduction, uh, you know, compared to alcohol, uh, you know, I think this is an amazing plant, but I think it should be used with respect in, um, you know, a sacred way with, uh, you know, prayer and offering to the four directions or, you know, whatever thing you want to do. But um, I, I stand for all plants, including the dandelion and cannabis. <laughs> So homeopathic medicine is another branch of natural medicine. Um, it's not always made from plants, um, but homeopathy was developed by uh, a physician, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, I believe in the 17, 1800s. He was a brilliant man, spoke many languages, and his motto was like cures like. And that sounds a little peculiar. What do you mean like cures like? Well, I mentioned earlier homeopathic coffee, a cruda or homeopathic coffee could help you to sleep because it calms a racing mind. Um, homeopathic poison ivy might help uh, you to overcome poison ivy more quickly. Uh, with homeopathy, it's a much more exact science. Uh, if you had an earache, you might just say, well, use echinacea as an herb. But with homeopathy, you might ask well, you know, dozens of questions, like is it the right ear or the left ear? Does the child want to be held or do they want to be left alone? Does the ear feel hot or cold? Um, is the child uh, having a high-pitched scream or is the child moaning? So you would ask all these questions to zero in on the, um, the most appropriate homeopathic remedy. And I've had experiences with homeopathy um, that within a few minutes they worked right away. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense because homeopathy is very, very diluted. Um, and again, they don't only use herbs, they might use things like minerals, like uh, sulfur or um, lead or a virus. Like if you had an epidemic of whooping cough, pertussis going through the schools, you might take homeopathic pertussin to help protect you from catching something that was going around the schools. Um, but I've seen it be amazingly effective, and I use homeopathy a lot in first aid conditions, like uh, one of those other don't leave home without it remedies is homeopathic arnica. Um, arnica is not something you would want to use as a tea. It's considered you know, slightly toxic, but as a homeopathic remedy, we know that arnica moves a blood protein called fibrin, which can help reduce swelling, inflammation, bruising, black and blueness, um, and it can help you to heal more quickly. Um, you don't want to use arnica topically on broken skin, but to take either the little white pellets internally and then apply a arnica cream around the area but just don't put it on broken skin um, but yeah i'm i'm certainly a believer in homeopathy and it, it doesn't make sense because it's so diluted but interestingly enough the more diluted it is the stronger it is and the more likely you will even need to meet with a homeopath or talk to uh, you know a, an herbalist or natural nature path to find the right remedy for you. So um, there's so many natural remedies we can use if we just take the time to learn about them. You know I've had people tell me that that's been very helpful for them. Um, I'm not a practitioner of that so but I have clients who say that it's been helpful but sometimes I see people you know finding out like oh I had this technique done and now I can eat gluten well you might have been better off not eating it so uh, you know I see people like oh I did this and now I can drink all the milk that I want it's like well you might be stressing your body out in another way or even stressing the environment out so I, I am gonna say that's not my area of expertise yet 
Well, um, mint is so easy to grow, and people are worried about mint that it's gonna take over, but you can um, use mint in smoothies or green drinks, juicing it, it freshens your breath. It's antiviral, so it's a great herb for colds and flu. You could um, add mint to the bath in the summertime because it makes your bath cooler. You could make a tea of mint, chill it in the refrigerator, put it in a spray bottle and mist yourself if you're having hot flashes or if you're just overheated from exertion. Another herb that's in the mint family or the Lamiaceae family is lemon balm. And lemon balm has a nice lemony taste. It's a wonderful herb for children with attention deficit. It's uh, an antidepressant. And one of the most important things about lemon balm is it's food for the bees. So we really should all be thinking about how can we support our decreasing bee population, which is a very serious environmental concern. So when we grow lemon balm, we're actually providing something that causes the bees to you know, be happy and busy and safe and you know, collecting easy nectar um, to support them. Uh, so that's another good one. But to be honest, I love growing weeds and I eat a lot of them. Dandelion greens, uh, stinging nettle, chickweed, cleavers, um, uh, lamb's quarter, which is wild spinach. And I am so much more interested in eating wild lamb's quarter than cultivated spinach. And I purposely grow lamb's quarter because it survives the hot summertime drought and we'll, my lamb's quarter is still proliferating, um, whereas the spinach like was gone in about June. So I think that eating the weeds actually helps to strengthen our, immu our immunity and helps us to be more adaptable to this polluted world because the weeds have to struggle for their survival. And if we want to be able to adapt um, as we campaign for a cleaner environment, I feel that eating the weeds is really one of our great allies. And we've been bamboozled to think that everything we eat needs to have a barcode and a label, needs to come in a plastic bag with directions. And it's not how it was uh, 100 years ago and it's not how it needs to be. We really need to learn that nature is providing us with so many uh, wild edible plants. And uh, really a, a really disgrace to our nation is we are currently using a, a third of our nation's water water supply to water grass, which is a crop that we don't eat. I know, maybe if you juice wheatgrass or something, but most people are growing that in trays. So um, we should really rethink that our lawns could really be an opportunity for salad greens and herbal tea and natural habitat for the, the bees. Um, and a lot of those are our great allies. But other things that I have in my yard that are easy to grow, violets, edible leaves, a traditional anti-cancer remedy, beautiful purple flowers that are edible. Thyme is uh, very antimicrobial. That's why it was used in Listerine, guaranteed to kill germs. Um, but thyme is wonderful for lung um, infection and, and also coughs and uh, allergies. And fairies are said to dance upon a bed of thyme. So if you believe in fairies and want to encourage their uh, coming to dwell in near you, then why not? Shakespeare said it. Well, I've been interested in natural medicine uh, since I was very young. My grandmother was French Canadian, and when I would go visit her, she always had some kind of herbal potion. I grew up like wearing a little medicine bag around my neck, and she would put garlic in, in the medicine bag. And I would, when I would see my parents again, they would say, why do you listen to her? Those are old wives' tales. And I would adamantly say, but they really work. And I would much rather do her remedies than get a shot or take antibiotics. So uh, my grandmother's idea of ice cream was to put maple syrup, which we made, on snow. And for me, it was like something out of a fairy tale. So by the time I was 15, I went to an all-girls boarding school, Miss Hall School, and I sort of was an alternative practitioner there where the young ladies would come to my room when they had cramps or headaches or stomach aches or couldn't sleep, and I would Basically, even though I was a kid, I was trying out herbs that had been used throughout history and found that they worked really well. And uh, I've never worked in any other industry except with natural foods. I've had two natural food vegetarian restaurants in my life. I've worked in natural food stores and natural pharmacies. I have a private practice and I've written 13 books. But this is a subject you can study your whole life. But I would say probably by the time I was uh, 
you know, 15 years old, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And even in boarding school, if this is helpful to any other young people, anytime I had a paper or a project to do in school, I would turn it into an opportunity to learn about herbs. So if I was uh, studying, uh, you know, French history, I would write a paper on herbal medicine during the French Revolution. If I was uh, studying Spanish, I would write a paper on hierbas medicinales de Mexico. Um, if I was studying chemistry, I would write about the phytochemicals in plants. So, um, you know, anytime you have a paper, it's really your call on what you want to write about. So make it something that is going to be of value to your life would be my advice to young people. So um, in the morning, I um, drink lemon and water. I do yoga, not for very long because I'm really busy, but I try to do yoga for you know at least half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, I usually have some kind of wild green drink or some kind of uh, breakfast. We eat a lot of wild food in our house, so it might include like wild elderberries or mulberries. That's one of our favorite things to do is, you know, go collect wild greens. I feel that they make us feel super strong. I do take some supplements. Um, but I'd say that there's nothing I do that I feel is really unhealthy. Um, so like, rather than thinking it's a sacrifice or I have to give something up, um, I feel like really blessed that, you know, my friend David Wolf likes to say, nothing, feel, nothing tastes as good as feeling good feels. So, you know, everything is like full of things that uh, improve your health. And, you know, I could make a list of all the healthy things to do during a day. Take an aromatherapy bath, um, facial acupressure, stand on my head, uh, walk outdoors in fresh air, um, eat seaweeds, eat wild food. And I, I found that uh, it would probably take a week to do all the things that I would want to do in a day. So I actually created a list that lists all the healthy things I could do in a day. And then I, across the list, I made a li uh, the days of the week. So I really try to do uh, maybe seven to 10 really super healthy things a day, which might be, you know, a hike or a dance um, or eating some kind of super food or um, yeah, a meditation practice, listening to self-help tapes, cleaning something, because it's not only about our physical body. We want to put attention into our relationships, our partner, our children, our creativity. I, am, I do lots of artsy things with my uh, hands. I have a goal of making two quilts for each of my grandchildren before I leave the planet and reading lots more books. So I see all of that as health practices. I really want to make a stand for the dandelion because dandelion has been a much maligned weed. And Emerson said, a weed is an herb whose virtue has not yet been recognized. And I, I, we need to stand for the dandelion because it's everywhere. And I feel that its message is saying, use me lots. You can eat the greens in the springtime. They're bitter um, after they flower, but you know, we shouldn't be afraid of a little bit bitter. But if you want them to taste sweeter, collect them before they flower. You can eat the flowers. I have all kinds of recipes that I make with the dandelion flowers, everything from, you know, dandelions and smoothies to dandy mushrooms that I make in the food dehydrator to dandelion loaf. Um, you can dig up the root and eat it as a food. The dandelion stems can be used like pasta. Um, they're also one of the first foods for the bees. Dandelions, just the fact that they are so hardy and survive so much adversity, when the grass is dead, the dandelions are still standing strong. And I feel that that's really one of our answers to helping us adapt to the pollutions that exist on our planet. So as we campaign for a cleaner world, let's make friends with the dandelion. They are not the enemy, pesticides are. What foods are prominent in my life? I would say wild foods. Stinging nettle, we make a lot of use of. Um, I make stinging nettle pesto, and no, it does not sting your mouth. I use it in juice. I make soup out of it. Um, I would say dandelion greens are another prominent food. I, I love blueberries, but there's another uh, berry that I make use of, and that's service berry or June berry. It's in the rose family, and they taste a lot like blueberries, but they grow on a bigger shrub, so one little shrub can give you so many berries. Think about planting a service berry little shrub. They are so good, and foods that are blue in color like that are really high in proanthocyanidins. They're good for brain function and your eyes and uh, capillary circu you know, circulation to your extremities. Um, 
I also eat chia seeds. I travel with chia seeds. They, you soak them in water and they absorb seven times their weight in water and then you can flavor them up. Instead of oatmeal, you know, chia seeds could be flavored like oatmeal with cinnamon, apples, raisins. They're high in omega-3s. So that's another important food in my diet. I do my best to eat gluten-free. I like to say I'm high raw, mostly vegan, sometimes flexible. Um, you know, I travel to a lot of places, but that's kind of my, you know, tagline for what I do my best. And I do um, allow myself one mocha a week, usually on Sunday, where my partner and I synchronize our day planners so we know who's going to be where and doing what. And that's just sort of a little treat. But, you know, we have it with uh, oat milk or almond milk or, or make our own hazelnut milk. <laughs> It would really be great for everybody to grow something, even if it's sprouts or growing something on your balcony or your porch, or think about reclaiming your yard. I think a lot of us feel disempowered. Maybe we live in homeowner land where the association doesn't want you to grow anything, but we really need to start attending those meetings and creating social change because using a third of our nation's water to water grass is wasteful. And that might've been a cool thing like in the 1800s, but it's not, sustainable anymore. So if we would think about creating more edible lawns, I have an article you can find online. It was on Huffington Post called Get Off Your Grass and Create an Edible Lawn. I think that should be a little mantra that resonates in all of us. Um, you know, if you're recycling, recycle more. I live right downtown Boulder and I compost and recycle. So we really need to, you know, do more. You're recycling glass. Well, you know, what can you do to buy less, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle? You know, I also want to share that I'm 63 years old and I've never learned to drive a car. And yet I've managed to raise two children, have three grandchildren, write 13 books. Um, people think that cars liberate them. And I have people say, I don't see how you can stand not driving um, because, you know, it takes uh, an hour and a half to take the bus to the airport. But if I drive my car, it only takes an hour. And I say, yeah, but how many more hours a week or month do you need to work at your job to pay for gas and new transmission, insurance, car repairs? So I just want to say it is possible to live on planet Earth without owning or even knowing how to drive a vehicle. And I know there's the thing about like, well, what would you do if there's an emergency? Well, like if it's really bad, you're supposed to call 911, but I also you know, know how to do first aid and I have delivered babies. But, um, you know, I also know my limitations. So, you know, I would really like to suggest that we need to be part of the solution and not depend on the government or big business to make the change. But what can we do? Um, learn how to use public transportation. You know, it's, there's phone apps. There's, you know, you can look on your computer like, when's the bus? I need to get to this town by this time. And yet I managed to travel all around the world. Um, using public transportation and carpooling. And I always, if I ask somebody for a ride to a party, I say, you can ask me any herbal questions you want. I'm happy to, you know, give you a little download. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think Gandhi said this, be the change rather than waiting for the world to change. What can you do? And we can all do something and we can all do more than we're already doing. So keep challenging yourself and growing. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to, you know, share a little bit of things that are important to me that I hope become more important to you. And I wish you all many thanks and many blessings.